Thanks. Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Eyal and Doreen for organizing the conference, not just in the polite sense that visitors and local participants thank organizers, but I'd like to mention the obvious, which is that this conference is exciting because it puts a really big question on the table, a question about whether we can hope for a better outlook on the institutions and rules through which we govern our lives. Um, I think many of us have grown used to specialization and fragmentation in lots of what we do, and so the appearance of genuinely big ideas is pretty rare, and if you'll excuse the grandiosity, inspirational. So for that, really, thanks. Um, and I'd also like to thank David for his contribution, which sent me back to a bunch of texts that were formative for my thinking about law, and also sent me some additional texts that I didn't know and resonated with those formative texts. So when an article sends you to the library, and I'm not speaking figuratively, I actually did go to the library. Um, you know it's done some real work, and that in itself is a cause for appreciation. Um, as I read it, David's piece performs twice. That is, it works in two different ways. The first is the act of framing. That is, it takes questions that animate the conference, or at least the first half of the question about sovereignty, and places them in terms of jurisprudential conflict, reminding us of a particular tradition in which many of the questions haunting us today about sovereignty were treated, were treated deeply and with passion. It is not just as political theory, but as a question of jurisprudence. And second, it intervenes in and upsets the traditional binaries that organize jurisprudential debates um, by introducing this middle ground uh, in that classic debate and then personifying the positions through Kelsen and Schmidt with Heller in the crucial, problematic, but hopeful middle. Um, I'll mostly concentrate on the middle, uh, but before beginning, I'd like to pause over a preliminary account of why it might be useful at all to consider the jurisprudential perspective as something special. So uh, the reason to do that is because there's something odd about jurisprudential conflict, which is that the stakes are often extremely unclear. So there seems to be plenty of disagreement on the one hand on the jurisprudential level among people who might actually agree about institutional outcomes. And often there's jurisprudential agreement about people who disagree on what the law should be or on which institutions should be established. And it also seems fairly clear, at least to me, but I could be, dis could be accused of having a, a deconstructive attitude about this, um, but it seems fairly clear to me that having the right jurisprudence uh, doesn't actually dis directly decide whether particular institutions will get established, funded, manned, or in short, whether they'll proliferate and flourish let alone whether they'll succeed in, in some measure in governing. Skepticism about the importance of a jurisprudential position is heightened by the fact that the analytical view implies that both sides of the debate might be coherent and that there's actually choice or that the answer is a matter of perspective. So perhaps the most famous choice in this regard is Kelsen's regarding the status of international law. Right? One could view the source of international law as the agreements among sovereigns, or one could see the international order as the source of sovereignty itself, and the choice for Kelsen, at least, is not decidable on analytical or pure theoretical grounds. So I won't try to develop that here, uh, but I think it may be enough to suggest that the question lies less in a jurisprudential perspective's ability to settle once and for all the right answers, and more about setting up a frame for what kind of institutional arrangements are most legitimate from a perspective internal to law. In that sense, it's about a frame for aspiration, a path of thinking that leads one to consider whether this or that particular institution is a worthy bearer of whatever role law has in your jurisprudence. One's jurisprudence then sets up an orientation for hope. So I'll come back to this slightly odd formulation in a few minutes, but now onto the main issue, which is to stake out how the middle position uh, between Kelsen and Schmidt, or between a jurisprudence that sidesteps sovereignty and a jurisprudence uh, that is subservient to sovereignty, how it works. And here I want to touch on two issues. The first is how the middle works, or in what sense Heller's position is, as David puts it, both distinctive and valuable. So Heller's middle retains a special, law for, uh, a special role for law and legal principles, even as it reaches out to something beyond positive law, something in the way of a non-transcendent uh, a set of non-transcendent principles um, that amount to, I'd say, the rule of law. Non-transcendent because they're part of a particular culture's formation of legality. They include something scientific, rational, uh, 
and opposed in its tenor to religious certainty, if, if we could call Schmidt's position a sort of religious certainty. Uh, we could talk about it in different terms, but I, I don't think those would be distorted too much. Um, so opposed to that and centered on the idea of generating a common frame for political life or for social compromise. But the key for Heller is that the state may violate the prescriptions of positive law, even though these are instantiations of its own existence, right? So this is uh, quoting David Spies. What makes the process appropriate is that both institutionally and substantively, the interpreters of the law must regard themselves as participating in a process of legislation which instantiates, instantiates fundamental ethical principles of law. So the fundamental principles must include the logic of uh, individual liberty in political theory, and they must end, and this is again quoting, they must end in democracy and equality. The logic has to be reflected in law, since law and legal theory makes sense of, legal theory that makes sense of law can only be understood once they are nested within a political theory. That's David's take on Heller. So, uh, and according to the paper, this isn't simply desirable on Heller's account, it's required of the, of the framework. So, in an age that uh, harkens back to Schmidt for inspiration, uh, Heller's alternative becomes important. The implication is that neither Kelsen's pure positivism, where any content at all can become law, nor Schmidt's non-positivism, where power trumps law, uh, supplies an attractive option. In the international realm, Heller, Heller saw state sovereignty as, pro as primary, while binding it to non-positive non ethical principles intrinsic to legal government. Right? This is a very internal point of view about what, what the intrinsic is. And perhaps opening, opening the way to the elaboration of a principle of humanity. And that's sort of where David leaves off. Um, so in, in a sort of aside, it would pay to flesh out the jurisprudential argument to clarify the relationship between two seemingly disparate parts, right? The definition of the state and the sovereign on the one hand, the question of the priority of municipal versus international law on the other. Uh, so most positive this analytical jurisprudence don't touch on this at all, but Kelsen is actually obsessed with, the, uh, with this question. Uh, it's mentioned almost in passing David's paper, but he talked about it a little bit more here, and, and it is an additional terrain on which Kelsen and Schmidt work out this jurisprudential conflict. So, um, but I'll, I'll leave that aside. The, the second issue, right, beyond how the middle works is uh, that I'll mention here is whether there might be other sources and perhaps better developed to look for a path through the narrow strait, right, the Scylla and Charybdis of Schmidt's monstrous sovereignty cum dictatorship and a positivism that's too scientifically purified or perhaps sterilized, impotent, to supply any ethical pushback against power clothed in legal dress. Um, and when I say better developed, uh, that probably betrays my affinity for scholars who live beyond the age of 42, right? So, um, so I'll, you know, which is not something I can be proud of, but anyway. So I'll mention quickly two avenues. One is Kelsen himself. Uh, David hints at, but sort of dismisses the, dismisses the, the possibility that Kelsen is really a source here. Uh, his student, Lars Vinks, wrote a, an entire book claiming that, uh, that we should read Kelsen as a source. Uh, on, on this particular point because that reading combines the pure theory of law with, with Kelsen's political theory, uh, which I'm familiar with mostly from uh, a piece called Foundations of Democracy, uh, that spells out a normative vision of legal science that grounds a particular ethics and generates a rule of law vision that isn't contentless, uh, even though the content is formulated in formal terms. So Kelsen has a full-blown defense of democracy. It rests on equality and minimization of the limitations on freedom. And while it takes some effort, it's possible that that theory can be brought together with his jurisprudence. So one reading, and I think it's David's reading, is these two things are just not, uh, not compatible. Kelsen has a political theory, and Kelsen has a jurisprudential theory. And the political theory is about what's good, and we should do that because it's good. And then the jurisprudential theory is about how we know what the law is. And, and they're completely separate. Uh, I, I think there's a plausible reading that, uh, that they might be brought together. So the argument isn't that democracy is absolutely required for there to be law, but that there can be clear affinities between the rule of law as envisaged in the pure theory and the form of law making uh, that we see in democratic states. Uh, the second avenue, to, um, I'm going to leave that aside. The, the second avenue 
uh, leaves the continent and looks to Anglo-American non-positivism. And of particular interest for me here is Lon Fuller. So Fuller's conception of the rule of law, especially what he calls implicit laws of lawmaking, is particularly apt in this setting, even though it doesn't tackle the question of sovereignty in precisely the same terms. But the solution seems quite close to what Heller proposes uh, because it suggests that rule of law values that are procedural in nature serve as an internal morality for making law. Uh, the solution injects a certain kind of morality into law, though it's not a full-blown comprehensive vision of the good. It's a sort of role morality for lawmakers. So without developing Fuller's thesis completely, I want to try to suggest kind of abstractly uh, that it joins the two parts of the discussion I've laid out, that is about, uh, about what jurisprudence does and about what this middle road might be. So. Um, that Fuller charts a, a, middle, a middle way, uh, sort of a morality-infused rule of law, uh, seems pretty clear. But his jurisprudential attitude is just as crucial because it already acknowledges serious limitations on the analytical conclusions uh, that one might rely on. So it sets itself up as a jurisprudence of counterexamples, jurisprudence that's always open to showing up its own incompleteness. One way Fuller expresses this comes through in generalizing about his, he has eight desiderata of law's internal morality, which I won't elaborate here, but, uh, but he labels this, the attitude about this. He says this is chiefly a morality of aspiration rather than of duty. And this seems to me at least like a key moment. It points out uh, that jurisprudence might play a role in orienting our aspirations and that strikes me as precisely the goal of, of the project and the conference, in a way. Um, so let me just close with Fuller's take on what the inner morality of law amounts to as a, as a morality of aspiration. Uh, Fuller argues that the basic morality of social life includes um, duties that run towards other persons, normally in the form of prohibitions, right? Do not kill, do not injure, uh, do not deceive. And these are easily definable with, with precision. But the demands of the inner morality of law are quite different because, for the most part, they're affirmative. Right? Make the law known, make it clear, make it coherent. They're too creative and open-ended uh, to be well-formulated as duties because they, to the extent they're duties, they're always pitched in terms, in matter, as matters of degree. So as you can try to do this, do it a little bit better. And so uh, I'll finish by quoting a sentence one sentence of Fuller's uh, that seems to have been written in response to his invitation to the conference. Um, uh, it says, in, in some situations, nothing can be more baffling than to attempt to measure how vigorously a man has intended to do that which he has failed to do. All of this adds up to the conclusion that the inner morality of law is condemned to remain largely a morality of aspiration and not of duty. Its primary appeal must be to a sense of trusteeship. Thank <laughs> you.